Well, good evening. It is great to be with you this evening. This is uh, exciting on so many levels. Uh, it's just great to be together. I, I love seeing all the fellowship and all the conversations that happen around our times together. It's really like family. Uh, we are blood-bought brothers and sisters in the Lord, and what a thrill it is to be together. And when I think about the the combined hours in a day, the combined hours in a week, particularly when I think about our students and I think about what it means to sit in a classroom uh, under a worldview uh, for hours a day. And uh, you homeschool moms who are inculcating a biblical worldview, praise God for you. And uh, for others who have to sift through what they hear all the time. There is a competition for minds and hearts that particularly plague our students, and we need to pray for our students. If you just do the math and think, okay, six hours a day at school, multiply by five, that's 30 hours a week in one week at school competing with one sermon, student ministries, a small group, Sunday night, a handful of hours for the, the competition in a mind and a heart and in the affections for a student to think God's thoughts after him and not be squeezed into the mold of this world. It really is a challenge. And when you think about uh, those of us who are out of school and in the workplace, I mean, I think about my workplace. I, I, I go to a hostile environment every week and I try to share the gospel with my coworkers and they just won't listen. No, I know I'm, I have a weird job. I'm so sorry. It's abnormal. Uh, they don't tell anybody, but they pay me to read my Bible. Uh, but, but for most believers, to walk from time under the word with God's people is like a breath of fresh air compared to the rest of a week in a potentially hostile environment uh, with competing worldviews and people with different sets of priorities. It is just good for us to be together. It's particularly good and timely for us to be looking at the book of Daniel. And I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. And Daniel is in the prophet section of your Bible. Even though uh, Daniel was not properly a prophet, he didn't hold the office of prophet like many of the speaking and writing prophets did. He was something of an administrator in a government office in a foreign country. And yet God spoke through him and gave us uh, this remarkable book. We're going to be studying the book of Daniel for some time over the next year in our evenings together. And what I want to do this evening is give you the first of two introductions. Uh, next week, we'll do an introduction proper where we look at the geopolitics surrounding Daniel's situation. Uh, we look at where Daniel sits in the Bible. We'll look at some of the prominent themes, uh, when it was written and why. Uh, what I want to do this evening is make an appeal for why we ought to study Daniel. And you're thinking, well, that's kind of silly because I'm here, aren't I? I already want to. You don't have to sell me on the book of Daniel. Uh, but I want to resell you on the book of Daniel this evening and get our hearts around some of the things that we're going to be looking for. And, and really, I want to front load our study of the book of Daniel with some pastoral care that comes from this book. I believe this book will be so timely for us given the situation that we find ourselves in in our world, in our day. That we need Daniel. And I think we're going to find out through our investigation of Daniel that this is a timely study for us. I think it will be rather easy to personalize the import of this book. It's going to be easy to see how this applies to our lives. So this evening is something of a list, and in no particular order, of reasons we need to look into this book in detail. And so, spoiler alert, if you were hoping to sort of get Daniel just little bit by little bit and not know how it ends or not know what comes down the storyline, just gonna let you know we're gonna jump ahead quite a bit this evening and uh, get some previews. So, let me pray and we'll dive into this. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be together. What a privilege it is to be together with Bibles open in our language to have access to your mind, access to your heart, access to your ways of thinking, access to your expectations for our lives. And when we think about reading a, a book that was 
written so long ago in another language to another group of people, and we find such ready impact on our own lives, our conclusion must be that you are the God of the universe, and you have penned this book, and you have penned it for our instruction. You love your people. You have sought to reveal yourself. You have sought to reveal your character. You've sought to reveal some of the history of your people, and you've sought to reveal some of the prehistory of the world. You have foretold things that are still yet future to our own existence here, and we can look back with confidence at the things that you have told in advance that came true in detail, and that gives us confidence in your promises related to the future. God, we need to look back and we need to look forward. We need to examine our own hearts and our own lives. We pray that we would come away from this study with everything you intend by it. And we ask it uh, by your power and for your glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Number one on my list, again, not, not an order of importance, just order that showed up on my notes here. We need to think about what it's like to be exiles in a foreign land. Daniel is going to give us a perspective of what it is like to not be home. Daniel and his four friends were kidnapped from their homeland, taken to the capital of the enemy, and kept there for perhaps the entirety of their lives. Uh, the Babylonian exile was 70 years where Israel was displaced to Babylon. And Daniel and his three friends were taken in the first of three deportations. They were there for a long time. You need to think about this, like what would it have been like in World War II to be taken from your home as a young teenager and taken to Berlin or Tokyo? What would it have been like in the 1960s to be deported to Hanoi? <laughs> Just think about what's at stake in terms of a, the life of a teenager being taken from his home and from his comforts, and specifically in Daniel's situation, being taken from the land of promise, the place which God had promised his blessings for obedience on a specific people. And here, in consequence to disobedience, they are exiled to a foreign land, particularly the land most feared and the capital of that enemy empire, and placed there, and effectively brainwashed into the culture and the ways of that foreign entity. Now look at Daniel chapter 1, and we'll just sort of get Daniel's introduction here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans." Verse 6, now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So these three youths are transported from home, kidnapped, <laughs> told, no, you have to learn Babylonian ways. You, you've got to learn the religion and the history and all the wisdom of this enemy of God's people. And by the way, we're going to rename you after our gods. <laughs> this would be a, a challenge. So 605 BC, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah as teenagers are kidnapped and deported to the enemy capital. Turn to Psalm 137 for a moment. I want you to get a feel for what faithful exiles would think about and God, through his prophets, had instructed the Jews in Babylon to go there to pray for the welfare of Babylon. In its welfare, you'll have welfare. To marry, to have children. 
Think about what it would be like to be a first generation or second generation Babylonian captive but citizen of Israel. Psalm 137 is a a song that was sung. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. And Zion is that affectionate term that God has for Israel, specifically Jerusalem, the mountain city, which is the capital. That was his term of endearment when God sought to set his affections on Israel and his uh, unstoppable love for Jerusalem. He referred to it as Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing Yahweh's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So for the exiles, recognizing for their entire earthly existence, they were in a foreign land. They belonged to another place. Thinking about Daniel and his friends in captivity in Babylon, in exile, will be a good help for us. For every believer, purchased by the blood of Christ, Philippians 3.20, made a citizen of heaven, this is not home. As comfortable as we might be at times, we must learn to live as exiles. It will be helpful to see their attitude, to understand the mindset of faithful youths in exile, trusting God's plan. Here's a second reason we need the book of Daniel. You and I increasingly will be pressed upon to stand against the tide of popular opinion to stand against local customs, to be oppressed by political power, to be harmed by enemies, persecutors, to be trapped, even trapped legally and prosecuted. Daniel and his friends experience these very things. We'll see how Daniel and his friends acted with integrity. They were exemplary in their character. They worked hard at their tasks, and everybody knew they were above reproach. How are we going to get these guys? We're going to catch them praying. We're going to make up rules that then we know they're going to violate, and we're going to assign them capital punishment. It's helpful for us in our day to think through what will it be like for us to face such persecution? What will it be like when Christians are entrapped by changing regulations, changing legislation, tyranny, or even mob rule? We're starting to get a feel for that in our culture. We will increasingly feel that legally, I believe. Each successive kingdom in this Babylonian exile lasted longer than a human lifespan. And we'll see in Daniel's work the unfolding of the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persians and the Greeks and finally the Romans. These are long spans of human history and world empires, longer than an individual human life. What would it be like to be under an oppressive government that hated God and went against God's ways your entire life? I think it's helpful for American Christians who have been accustomed to second half of the 20th century comforts, privileges, freedoms, expectations, to get a feel for what it is like to be faithful when those things change. What must we be like? Do we have some models and examples of that in this book? Look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar had set up a giant statue, demanded that people worship it. In verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to the three youths, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods 
or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Fast forward a little bit. What will it be like for Christians to hear words like this? Is it true, Christian, that you do not bow the knee to CRT? Is it true that you do not bow the knee to LGBT or any other sets of acronyms that rhyme with that? So now, Christian, here's your chance. When you hear the music, just go along with the crowd. And if you don't, we've got this oven over here or whatever other form of government persecution, legislative authority, judicial power they may throw. Christian, are you ready to hear those words? You may have already heard them in your workplace. You may have already heard them in a classroom. Just toe the line. You don't even have to believe it. Just say it. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to be trapped into a test of loyalties, uh, a surface-only loyalty to the tide of human culture, or a from-the-heart, through-and-through loyalty to Yahweh? And when you hear a persecutor, a government, a teacher, a coach, a friend, a family member say, what God is there that can deliver you out of my hand? We ought to tremble for Nebuchadnezzar and say, ooh, we shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Don't test my God. But if he doesn't take care of you now, he'll take care of you in the end. And my God will take care of me even if I burn in your flames. <laughs> Are we ready to say those things? We need this book. Thirdly, we need to learn from the example of young men. A 15-year-old with courage and conviction and integrity and faith whose impulse is to pray and trust God. And we've got a lot to learn from some teens, from some young teens. They don't even have their chariot license yet. <laughs> Those of you in this room who are teenagers, are you ready to teach us what it is like to not waste your teen years, to live faithfully for the Lord, counterculturally, to swim upstream, to go against the grain, to count your own lives as nothing if only you could be faithful to the Lord. Listen, teenagers, are you ready to be the last man standing in your classroom? Are you ready to be the last young lady standing in your entire school? Are you ready to be the only guy on your team that's not going to laugh at those jokes? Are you going to be the guy that faithfully prays for everyone who would make fun of Christianity, knowing that your prayer and your evangelism may be the only way they ever hear about Christ? We need to learn from these youths. And us old fogies lament the years we wasted. And you young men, young women have an opportunity. Fourth reason we need Daniel, we need to revisit prayer. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. Verse 17. This comes in the context of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It troubled him. He couldn't sleep. He asked everybody he knew to figure it out for him. Nobody could. Kill all the wise guys. And Daniel and his friends were in that crowd. What was Daniel's response? He replied to the, the rulers with discretion and discernment, verse 14. Verse 17, Daniel went to his house, informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel's impulse is to pray. It's to pray. 
Turn to chapter 6, verse 10. New administration, King Darius. King Darius got trapped into a silly law that trapped Daniel. And the rule was going to be, you can't pray to anybody but Darius. <laughs> Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now on his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Daniel prayed, and Daniel prayed as he had been doing. I'm not going to change anything, even though the king's got a new rule. And he was willing to pray, even though it would cost him. And then Daniel chapter 9, first 23 verses, is a long prayer from Daniel, pleading before God, confessing his sins and the sins of the nation, the sins that got them into exile in the first place, and pleading with God for compassion and mercy. Interestingly, appealing to God on the basis of his own promises. Look at verse 1. In the year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Now this is an interesting window into prayer and the sovereignty of God. God's made a promise about 70 years of exile. Daniel knows the 70 years. He's reading his Bible. He appeals to God on the basis of the promise that God has already made and pleads with God to keep that promise. It really is a wonderful prayer. That'll be a great exposition for us. Knowing that this is coming, it's just going to rev up, I believe, our desire to pray, to see our prayers link arms with the sovereign God of the universe and recognize that God uses means to accomplish His purposes. And our prayers are not outside of that. That leads to a fifth reason we need to study Daniel. It really gets towards the theme of the book of Daniel. We need to understand the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. We're going to see the sovereignty of God proclaimed on the lips of the rulers of world empires. Could you imagine if the G7 met tomorrow... And they all came out with a joint proclamation, all the world's top leaders of the world's most powerful countries, and they all got together and they said, we've come to an understanding together. Whoa, these seven countries have agreed on something? Yes, our understanding is this. The God of the Bible is the one true God, and he is sovereign over everything. Wouldn't that be great? It's effectively what happens twice in the book of Daniel. Look at chapter 4 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, which sits at the top of world powers in his day. And we'll walk through the geopolitics and how Nebuchadnezzar got there. Some fascinating history. But this evening, we'll just recognize that Nebuchadnezzar is the ruler of the world, essentially, at this point. And in verse 30 of chapter 4, He's on top of his roof and he says, Is this not Babylon the great which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? And you just think, oh, you shouldn't say that, Nebuchadnezzar. And while the, while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. Well, what an ironic statement. What kind of sovereignty do you really have if it can be taken away? He's not sovereign. He is a petty human sub-regent on a short leash held by the sovereign king of the universe who is truly king of all kings. 
and your sovereignty is taken away. What kind of a sovereignty is it? Look down at verse 34. At the end of the period of his humbling, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. And listen to this word on the lips of a pagan king who always got everything he wanted. God's dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth, myself included, are accounted as nothing. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand and no one can say to him, what have you done? Now we recognize that most rulers of world empires have not come to that conclusion, but they will. They will. And God's kindness, Nebuchadnezzar said that before he met him in the next life. Look down at verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Look over at chapter 6. Another world ruler comes to the same conclusion, Darius in verse 26. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. This is a world ruler acknowledging that he's not sovereign, but the God of heaven is. A sixth reason to study this book together is not just the truth of God's sovereignty, but the application of it to our own day. Think about our day right now. Uh, we live in the midst of political upheaval, it seems like every election cycle is bound to bring us another turnover, uh, unpredictability. Uh, we live in a polarized culture where every single issue becomes a dividing line with people on either side of the issue. People have lost their sense of humor over differences. Everything has become hostile. We are increasingly living in a time of economic uncertainty, and you and I need the bedrock stability of God's unfolding story and His meticulous sovereignty in the unfolding of its narrative. Here's what J.I. Packer says about the main idea of this book. In the face of the might and splendor of the Babylonian Empire, which had swallowed up Palestine, and the prospect of further great world empires to follow, dwarfing Israel by every standard of human calculation, the book as a whole forms a dramatic reminder that the God of Israel is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that heaven rules, that God's hand is on history at every point, and that history indeed is no more than His story, the unfolding of His eternal plan, and that the kingdom which will triumph in the end is God's. We need that message. We need that reminder. And just by way of perspective, the country in which we live is very young on the world stage. It may or may not last very much farther. We don't know. But all the kingdoms of the world that have come and gone have done so at the behest of God who is orchestrating all of human history. That is a bedrock for us we must hold on to. Number seven, in the face of coming persecution and the potential isolation of believers, we need courage, conviction, and integrity. We need to know, as Daniel discovered, as Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, I'm trying to get into the habit of saying their Hebrew names, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they're the blasphemous Babylonian names that were given to them. As these four men learned, those who are faithful to Yahweh are never alone. Even if you're the only ones in the fire, even if you're the only one in a cave full of ravenous lions, you're not alone. You're never alone. 
believers are never alone who are faithful to the Lord. We need to know that. Number eight, we need to be aware of the future. And there are details about the future we'll learn from Daniel, but there is also a perspective on the future that we must get from Daniel. Daniel experienced multiple changes of administration, multiple empires. After Daniel's life, uh, Daniel wrote about successive empires that would unfold. And in all of it, God's truth stands. The Assyrians would be forgotten. The Assyrians really until the 19th century would be forgotten even to historians and archaeologists. To the point that people thought Assyria is just a mythological uh, invention of Bible writers writing fables. They need, you need a scary enemy, and so you have to make one up. We'll make up the Assyrian Empire. There is no Nineveh. That was the prevailing archaeological view uh, in, in modern history up until uh, the late 1800s. And then we found the Assyrian Empire buried in the sand, found the city of Nineveh, and we realized the Bible was right all along. But empires come and go and are lost in the sands, blown to chaff, scattered about, and all but forgotten. And God's truth stands. Stands the test of time. When we think forward about the future, we need to recognize that God's truth not only has stood, but will stand. And His promises to His people are inviolable promises. He doesn't go back on what he says. He will keep his promises, and he demonstrates it over and over and over again. As we look forward to times of turmoil and tempest, uncertainties, we know that God's truth stands. Robert Dick Wilson says this, God gave us the book of Daniel to show by his providential guidance, his miraculous interventions, his foreknowledge and almighty power. The God of heaven controls and directs the forces of nature and the history of nations, the lives of Hebrew captives and the mightiest kings of the earth for the accomplishment of his divine and beneficent plans for his servants and his people. And you think about what's happening in the exile. <clears throat> It is certainly punishment for Israel's disobedience. It is also the incubation of a vulnerable Israel in a time of the collision of empires. And God promised all those who were in Israel at the time of the Babylonian captivity, listen, if you obey me and you trust me and you go to Babylon, I'll take care of you. And God incubated his people under the mighty umbrella of the Babylonian Empire so that they were not subject to the roving bands and political machinations of uh, every roving nation that went through Palestine that was like a corridor between the South Asian continent and Africa and Europe. Everybody went through there. And Israel was going to be protected, in part protected in Babylon. They would prosper there. They would multiply there they would be taken care of. And specifically, the Davidic line was taken care of, the line of Judah through David that would one day bring Messiah. God was very kind to keep his promises, even as he is disciplining his people. Number nine, we learn something about our Bible in Daniel. What do we learn about our bibliology? Uh, I think we're gonna gain confidence, once again, that the Bible is true that the Bible is true. One of the things that sets the Bible apart from every other book, and don't tell me about your fortune cookies and Nostradamus, they are in another universe altogether. The Bible tells the future in specific detail. And what the Bible says comes true. What the Bible says about the past is historically accurate. And what the Bible says about the future is historically accurate. In all of its details, every single time. In fact, the stakes are high on this. If the Bible makes an error, my friends, we close it and we walk away. God stakes his own reputation on the veracity of this book. And God makes some staggering claims, very specific details about the unfolding of kingdoms that were after Daniel's time that for us are history and we can look back at and say, that's exactly what happened. 
That's exactly what happened, and that, and that, and that. And those events which are still future to us that were future from Daniel's perspective, we can look forward to and say, yes, everything that is still yet future will happen in its details, just like the things that were future to Daniel but past to us happened in their details. And this becomes one of the serious roadblocks for criticisms against the Bible. You need to understand that libraries full of literature have been written about Daniel and have said, oh, you can't believe the book of Daniel. That's apocalyptic. And what they mean by apocalyptic is an intertestamental genre of literature where people had dreams and visions and wild ideas. And they wrote it down and people said, wow, this is exciting. Kind of like sci-fi. And while Daniel certainly wrote about some things that are terrifying and future, they're all true. You can't slot Daniel as apocalyptic so that you take away any attention to its details and cast it off as just some wide-eyed, wild-haired notions of some crazy man. The other approach to Daniel from those who are critics of the Bible is to say Daniel wrote after the fact. So when Daniel gets very specific, for instance, about Alexander the Great, hundreds of years after Daniel wrote, people say, well, it's, it's just too precise to be prophecy. And so we, we know that Daniel wrote after Alexander the Great, or even Daniel wrote in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes during the Maccabean Revolution uh, because he really wanted to gin up the revolt. Well, there's so many problems with that historically. Number one, the language of Daniel all fits the 6th century B.C. It all fits the time of the Babylonian captivity. There are copies of Daniel in the Qumran caves, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that could not have gotten there if Daniel wrote during the Maccabean revolt. Daniel, by that time, was already considered by Jews to be canonical. It was already distributed and well-known enough to have copies in the Qumran caves. That leaves the liberals and the critics of the Bible with nowhere to go. And what, what's crazy is their early criticism was the, the prophecies of Daniel are so specific and so accurate to what we know as history that Daniel couldn't have written it. It couldn't have written, been written before the time because it's too right. Isn't that an interesting criticism? And then when history proves that it actually had to predate the events, they're left with zero criticism. Now, we knew the Bible was true because God wrote it. But it's helpful to understand that the liberal attacks, the critical attacks on the Bible will fall one by one by one. Just like when the scholar said, there's no such thing as Nineveh, there is no Assyrian Empire. Oh, okay, wait, we found it. But we know the Bible's still not true. Daniel wrote after the fact. Okay, well, I guess this literature does predate Antiochus Epiphanes, but we still know the Bible's not true because I do, don't really want it to indict my life. That's the issue. And the scholars that have filled libraries with commentaries on Bible books, and you think, why did they spend their lives writing about the Bible if they don't believe it? They have an anti-supernaturalist bias, an antagonism to Scripture. They want to tear down the Bible. They want to tear down people's confidence in the Bible precisely because it indicts their own way of life. And Daniel's not going to let us get away with it. <laughs> Daniel's going to tell us the future, and it comes to pass. And then Dan Daniel's going to tell us about the distant future, and it will come to pass. Really, the critics of the Bible get embarrassed by this book. Number 10, we need to have a pessimistic view of the future of human history. We need to have a pessimistic view of human history. The world would tell us that we have made progress and we will make progress still. That is the prevailing so-called scientific notion the soft sciences, sociology, psychology, human anthropology, have followed the so-called hard sciences, 
in seeing some sort of development from simple to complex, from worse to better, an evolution from simple to really complex structures. And the period of enlightenment and humanism, the industrial revolution and medical advances have given people the impression that, hey, we can extend our lifespan, we must be doing something right. We've learned lots of things we didn't used to know, we must be getting better all the time. I'm smarter than my parents. <laughs> and we just think we're on this path of an upward trajectory. And nothing could be farther from the truth. The information age, has decreased our wisdom while increasing our information. Our access to technology has only increased human depravity's capacity to destroy one another. Now, we're not on an evolutionary uptick. Daniel's gonna remind us that empires come and go, and in the end, they're gonna get way worse. <laughs> there is not hope for human history as long as we look at human actors. Solomon said that one fly spoils the perfume, fly in the ointment. What happens when you have seven billion stinky humans ruining God's world? Collective depravity on top of individual and total depravity. Daniel's gonna help us get again this pessimistic view of the future of human history. But Daniel's also going to give us the glorious view of human history when God's kingdom comes. We need to see that. We need to anticipate that, long for that, and I think that is going to lead us to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come. Long for it. By the way, it is God's kingdom. It comes from heaven. He brings it about. That's not something we build. Just as a tip our hat towards where, what we're going to see in the unfolding of God's plan. Number 11, this is related. Eschatology is important. If we break up the book of Daniel thematically, we might loosely, this isn't a hard and fast breakdown, but the first six chapters are going to tell us some of the stories of Daniel and his friends and and some of the kings they interact with, and the seven through 12 are gonna be more visionary, more of the apocalyptic, prophetic realities of what is coming. And there are visions and prophecies in the beginning, and there is narrative in the end, so it's not a clean break. But we are going to get to some detailed prophecies, some of which have not yet been fulfilled, some are yet to come, and that is eschatology, or the study of last things. And we know from 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is profitable. So that applies to eschatological sections of Daniel. It is going to be profitable for us. But I would remind you of what Jesus said in Matthew 24.15 in the Olivet Discourse. He says, he quotes Daniel, and then he says, let the reader understand. Let the reader understand. He quotes a visionary, apocalyptic, prophetic, enigmatic, scary, creepy, weird, I can't understand it section of Daniel. And he says, reader, understand. Some of you have already begin, begun reading the book of Daniel, cyclically good. Some of you have stood in front of the wall and started making your way down the Daniel panel. I would encourage you, do that. The, the, the key to unlocking the deep mysteries of Daniel. You ready for it? Read it. Then read it again. Read it again. If you have hopes that what I'm going to do on Sunday nights here is tell you what Daniel means, because its meaning is not accessible on the words of the page. I tried reading it, I didn't get it. You're going to be disappointed in me because all I'm going to do is read it and 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 get clarity and work to explain it. So we can do that together and you can get a head start and you can do your pre-homework and just read the book of Daniel. It's amazing what happens when you read and you read again and you read slowly and you make observations and you ask good questions of a text and you let God's word answer I think we're gonna have some really remarkable clarity in this book. But the command for us from Jesus is that we read it and we need to understand it. 
bigger picture there is that eschatology is important. It comes under the rubric of all Scripture, which is God-breathed and profitable. And we are commanded to understand. And, and where the Bible stops speaking, we must stop speaking. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed are for us and for our children that we may teach them so as to obey. There are things for us here to understand about the future. By the way, anytime God opens his mind for us in his word, it's his own self-disclosure. He wants us to know. So we become students of the word, including eschatology. Number 12, we need to understand God the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, as unrivaled, peerless, and utterly unique. Something behind the scenes in Daniel is this God against the gods of the nations. There is a battlefield for supremacy in the minds of people for who is the one true God. And, and just a, a hint at this, thinking about the exile, what was the purpose of the exile? Israel had polluted the land with idolatry, had not obeyed God's word, so they got booted, just as God promised in Deuteronomy 29. And God promised to restore them and bring them back to the land and one day fulfill the promise of new covenant with circumcised hearts. But you need to understand that the exile was effective in making Israel forever monotheistic. After the exile, they did not worship the gods of the surrounding nations. And what's on display in the minds of the pagan nations around during the exile, what was it like for the Assyrians to, to go and just trounce the northern tribes? What was it like for Babylon to trounce Assyria and then walk through and lay siege to Jerusalem in one of the shortest sieges in ancient history? What was it like for them to just take the nobles, take whoever they wanted, and do whatever they wanted with the nation of Israel. The Assyrians thought, well, the Assyrians' gods are stronger than Israel's gods. And then the Babylonians thought, <laughs> the Babylonian gods are stronger than Egypt's gods, we're stronger than the Assyrians' gods, and we're stronger than the God of Israel. There is a God against God warfare in the regional deities of the ancient nations. They did their sacrifices, they had their priests, they had their cultic rituals, and if we did all of these things and then we won on the battlefield, that just proves that our God is the one true God. And over and again in the Old Testament, you would have a faithful believer in the one true God stand alone against the world, stand alone against faithless Israel who had access to the one true God, and God would vindicate his name. It's remarkable how patient God is with the nations. But what's at stake here is God's sovereignty over kings, God's sovereignty over nations, and the demonstration that God alone is the one true God. The Assyrians thought our gods are stronger. They didn't necessarily take into account that the reason Israel's here is because they disobeyed the one true God. Now, there were some Chaldeans who got it. We'll see that in the book of Jeremiah. There are a couple of Gentiles who figured out what Israel couldn't figure out and actually said to Israel, we're taking you captive right now because you disobeyed Yahweh. And Yahweh will have his own vindication. Listen to Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 21 to 25, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is God who sits above the circles of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. God stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither. The storm carries them away like rubble. To whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created the stars. God is peerless. Isaiah 44, verse 24 
Thus says Yahweh, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, I, Yahweh, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone, causing the omens of boasters to fail, making fools out of diviners, causing wise men to draw back and turning their knowledge into foolishness. We're going to see that in the book of Daniel. All the Chaldeans, all the wise guys, all the magicians made fools. They didn't know the future. They couldn't really interpret dreams. God's in charge of all of that stuff. Isaiah 44, 28. It is I who says of Cyrus, or Kurus, he is my shepherd. 200 years after Isaiah's prophecy, Cyrus would conquer Babylon. God calls him my shepherd. So here's a man who hasn't been born yet, hasn't been named by his parents yet, and in predictive prophecy, God says to the prophet Isaiah, I'm going to raise up Cyrus, and I'm going to use him as head of an empire that isn't even on the, the geopolitical radar yet to conquer an empire that hasn't yet taken the helm of world empire that will take Israel into captivity. I mean, you're three generations of rulership out and God is making this predictive prophecy down to a name and his specific activities. And the beginning of Isaiah chapter 45 describes in detail those activities. And then God says this, Verse 5 of Isaiah 45, I am Yahweh, there is no other, besides me there is no God. Listen, Cyrus, king of Persia, would not come about as a ruler by his own might. Any more than Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Darius of the Medo-Persians, or any other ruler in between. God is doing this, he tells the future, he predicates his own identity and power on that very thing. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. What is Marduk? What is Bel? They're nothings. There is only one God, the God of Israel. He is God over all the false gods. He is God over the demons. He is God over the made-up deities of human invention. And while the nations think about regional deities and battles won mean our God is stronger, God is up to things men know not of. And God will have his day and he will win. Lastly, we just need to remember that the answer to the world's political problems transcends man's ability to solve them. The best of men and the worst of men will try their hands at solving world problems, but Christ's kingdom is coming. Listen to Daniel 2.44. Here's the promise from God. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. This book of Daniel is going to lead us to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the King of all the earth who will reign on the earth and then usher in a new heavens and new earth under his good and sovereign rule, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a lot to look forward to in this book. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for... Daniel, thank you for putting these things in your word so that we would have access to them, so that we would have greater confidence in your word, so that we could know your heart and your mind, so that we would have examples before us of what it means to live faithfully, counterculturally, trusting you, and most of all, so that we could acknowledge your meticulous and absolute sovereignty over details, over big pictures, over vast sweeps of human history, over the conquest of empires and the individual destinies of people. We thank you for the promise of resurrection. We thank you for where this book will eventually point us to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who came to the earth in human flesh to take on our sin, to pay for sin, that all who would believe in him might be secure in his coming kingdom. And we pray all this in his name. Amen.